I hate to move people out of the room. It's so great to see everybody getting totally engaged. Um, uh, but we do want to move to our next panel. Uh, the good thing is that we do have uh, so many people, uh, such a rich discussion that we want to bring to you today. And so for this panel, um, which we have called uh, Living Sustainably, uh, our f first presenter this afternoon is going to be Ryan Kolker, who is with, with the National Institute of Building Sciences. And this is, again, a fascinating um, organization in terms of their mission and their work. It's just very cool, all the stuff that really goes into thinking about buildings, the science of buildings, the materials, the design, and everything. So, Ryan? Thanks. Thanks, Carol. Um, so um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, the, institutes and the Institute and its activities uh, towards the end, but um, I basically just wanted to uh, talk to you today about, you know, why, why are we talking about buildings and why are we talking about energy efficiency and renewables for buildings? Um, I guess kind of the uh, big picture that people uh, don't often recognize is that buildings are actually responsible for 40% of the primary energy use in the United States. So that's more than both transportation and industry. Um, and then if you look at the related carbon emissions, uh, it's 39%, uh, which actually equals the combined carbon emissions from Japan, France, and the United Kingdom. So um, it's a fairly significant uh, amount of energy and a fairly significant amount of carbon uh, emissions associated with buildings. One other thing that uh, we need to think about uh, in buildings in particular is that we spend 90% of our time indoors. It's where we live, where we work, where we play, where we uh, get healed, uh, where we go to school. Um, so it's really important that we have buildings that meet our needs while being uh, energy efficient, uh, sustainable, and then also uh, aspects like safety and security are uh, certainly important as well. So when we talk about buildings, we can talk about new construction and existing buildings, both equally important. Um, we tend to uh, see policies primarily focused on the new building side because uh, folks seem to think it's easier. Um, and to some degree it is um, because you have a codes and standards process in place that the building itself would not even be constructed unless it meets uh, minimum requirements uh, through the codes and standards. But I think it's important to note, though, that uh, just the fact that there are codes and standards doesn't mean that the uh, buildings being constructed are actually meeting those codes and standards. You need to have uh, an, a, an effective adoption and enforcement process in place to make sure that that happens. Um, I think one other thing that we, we tend to forget when we talk about codes and standards for buildings is that they primarily cover the, the major energy-using systems within buildings and then also kind of the building uh, envelope, uh, which kind of holds everything together. Um, but we don't really think about uh, codes and standards for buildings actually impacting the plug loads, uh, the things that you plug in uh, while you're inside the building. And those actually uh, tend to make up a ever-growing portion of the actual energy use that occurs within buildings. So we, we as a society need to come up with uh, some sort of mechanism uh, for dealing with those plug loads. Um, and I think one other uh, important thing to note is that uh, good buildings don't need to cost more. You just need to have a smarter process for doing it. Um, and then we also need to have some incentives and guidelines in place to actually go beyond the minimum requirements. So now if we, if we go on to existing buildings, um, over 70% of the buildings that will exist in 2030 are already here today. Um, so you won't have the type of opportunity uh, on a broad scale that you would have with new construction. Um, so you have to make sure that you tackle uh, the energy use uh, that's currently going on within existing buildings. So you need a, an appropriate mix of incentives uh, and mandates to make sure that uh, our existing buildings uh, achieve the energy efficiency uh, and energy conservation measures that, that we would like to see them have. I think you know, one thing that we really need to recognize is that a piecemeal approach uh, to incentives is not going to get us there. Um, we need to have kind of a holistic approach uh, to how buildings uh, are built, 
how they are incentivized. Um, we can only get, get so far with individual pieces of equipment uh, achieving greater levels of efficiency. We really need to look at it as how they interact together and uh, put an end goal out there. Um, I think you know one other critical aspect of existing buildings is that you need to have an appropriate operations and management scheme in place to make sure that how the building is designed, um, its intent is actually achieved throughout the life of the building. Um, buildings built today are meant to exist 40, 50, 60 years. Um, and if you don't take the proper steps for operations and management of that building, you're not going to get the results that you initially intended. Um, so one thing in particular we've actually been uh, heavily working on with the uh, High Performance Building Caucus uh, is to help federal agencies in particular develop those training skills uh, necessary to achieve their goals, that, which they've, uh, they've been given you know, fairly strict goals uh, as far as energy and water conservation. But to actually be able to meet those goals, you need to have uh, the people in place that have the skill set to actually achieve those goals. So um, we've been working with uh, Representative Carnahan and Representative Biggert, uh, particularly on uh, HR 5112. And uh, on the Senate side with uh, Senator Carper and Senator Collins on S3250 to be able to provide federal agencies with um, the necessary training uh, to be able to maintain the buildings that they have. One other uh, critical area is really the need to understand what we currently have. Um, so that requires uh, a robust data set, uh, programs like uh, energy emission. Ener Energy Information Administration's CBEX and REX surveys, which actually, uh, you know, survey the uh, building stock uh, and get a sense of how buildings are actually operating, what is their energy use. And so we basically need to know uh, how buildings are operating now so we can set goals for the future. If we don't know what we're measuring, we can't really uh, get to where we want to go. And so... Um, one of, the, one of the critical things about buildings is uh, the ultimate goal, uh, which is net zero energy. So basically what that would require is a mixture of energy efficiency and renewables to be able to achieve that goal. So we see at this point uh, a need to increase uh, the energy efficiency of a building by about 70 to 80 percent and then have the remainder of uh, the energy use required by that building uh, put on through uh, renewables, hopefully on the site level, but um, you know, there's certainly opportunities on a uh, community-wide level or even um, you know, a utility level. Um, as I started to mention, uh, high-performance buildings means more than just energy efficiency uh, and sustainability. You need to consider other aspects like safety, security, uh, response to hazards. They need to be functional need to have uh, consideration for the productivity that goes on within that building. Um, because if you're building a building uh, that's you know, highly energy efficient, um, but nobody wants to work there, it's not an efficient building. So you need to uh, take into consideration things like indoor environmental quality, um, accessibility, uh, aesthetics. Um, so that's all important aspects of uh, you know, how buildings should be uh, operated. I think uh, you know, one other important thing to recognize that uh, sometimes uh, people don't necessarily think about is that buildings actually form the nexus for a lot of the sectors of the economy. Um, when you talk about transportation, transportation is built to get people between buildings. Um, and now we're even looking them, at them as outlets for our, our vehicles. Um, a significant amount of materials go into the construction of buildings, which leads to manufacturing. Uh, it supports a considerable workforce, everything from laborers uh, to professionals like engineers and architects. And they come from small businesses and large multinational corporations. Uh, and then they depend on the financial sector to be able to have access to capital to be able to uh, build buildings. So that's kind of just a uh, smattering of, of why we should look at buildings, why we're talking about buildings. Um, as I mentioned before, uh, the High Performance Building Caucus uh, is here on the House side. Uh, Representative Carnahan and Representative Biggert serve as chairs. Um, 
one thing that uh, the caucus coalition has organized, which is made up of the private sector organizations that support the caucus, is uh, High Performance Building Week, which is actually celebrated uh, this year, June 13th through 19th. Um, we'll have some site visits uh, out to uh, the NIST uh, Building and Fire Research Lab. Um, we'll have several briefings here on the Hill. Um, one on just kind of what is the concept of high performance buildings? What do you need to consider? Uh, one on an initiative from across the building community on uh, what needs to happen to get to net zero energy buildings. Uh, we'll also have a uh, reception celebrating the uh, efforts on high performance buildings. Um, and um, we're doing a uh, congressional visits day as well. Uh, if you want information on that, it's www.hpbccc.org. And um, finally, I'll give you a uh, quick rundown of uh, the National Institute of Building Sciences. Uh, it was actually formed in the 70s by Congress, uh, recognizing that uh, the building community is kind of a disparate community made up of uh, different bits and pieces uh, that all ultimately uh, interact and should interact. And so the Institute was formed to uh, kind of make that interaction happen and to really understand, uh, you know, how various different building systems and components work together um, and basically hopefully come up with uh, common uh, goals and metrics. Um, just to note, the Institute's annual meeting will occur in December as part of EcoBuild, uh, which is here in D.C., uh, and you can get information on that from our website, which is www.nibs.org. Thank you. And now we'd like to turn to Chelsea Jenkins, who is the Executive Director of Virginia Clean Cities. And this will provide another perspective about things that go on in communities. And there are a variety of Clean Cities coalitions around the country. We're very, very glad that Chelsea's here to talk about Virginia's. Thanks, Carol. Um, and there are about 90 Clean Cities coalitions lo located throughout the United States. And I do want to recognize we have Barry Carr over here. And he's the coordinator from New York, so a lot of what I'm going to talk about he's also doing uh, in the state of New York. And I was asked uh, to come and talk about the Clean Cities program uh, in general today, but I did provide a presentation up here that kind of goes over what's driving the market forces that are driving alternative fuels, um, a little more of an overview of the Clean Cities program, and then we have lots of really great tools, including uh, they now are on your mobile phone. Um, like alt fuel station locators and light duty alt fuel vehicle searches and that kind of thing. So that's all in this presentation. Um, and so today's expo is uh, much about the solutions we have on the table to solve the energy challenge that we've faced for a very long time now and we've been talking about. Uh, but I did want to remind everyone that the transportation sector is sucking up the majority of the petroleum. Um, that we use in the country, and it's actually the only sector since 1973 that's actually increased its use of petroleum. Um, all the other in-use sectors, industrial, commercial, residential, have all shrunk uh, their use of petroleum uh, fuel um, in the last 60 years. And second, we use 25 percent of the crude oil in the world, and we only have 5 percent of the population. Um, so this has huge economic implications for our country including us spending over $200,000 per minute on foreign oil, um, and on the individual household level, uh, sending about $1,800 per year to uh, foreign markets. And as Ryan mentioned, um, the building sector does use uh, the majority of the energy, 40 percent, but on the individual household uh, level, 51 percent of our carbon footprint on the household level is actually due to driving our vehicles. Um, and then another uh, fact that I found related to the health and environmental impacts of transportation is, is that about 50,000 to 100,000 premature deaths occur each year related to air pollution. Um, so we have a problem. We know it's a problem. That's we're all, why we're all here today. Um, and it's really going to take a lot of market forces, government policies, and science and technological innovation to solve it. Um, but I really feel like small um, choices have, uh, or small changes have a really large impact collectively. So the average person can really make small choices. Um, 
And that's really choosing to drive fuel um, and uh, make like trip chaining and that kind of thing, just do things smarter every day. Um, and those that aren't familiar, how many have heard of the Clean Cities program? Okay, a good amount. There's still some that haven't. Um, the Clean Cities program is actually dedicated to advancing all of these decisions for fleets and for the individual consumer and to help them be smarter with their transportation choices. It's um, been around for 15 years, actually. It's a Department of Energy program. Um, and it's actually the only deployment program uh, within the federal government focused on deploying lower, lower carbon fuels and making more energy efficient transportation choices. Uh, the program doesn't pick winners or losers. We have uh, fuel and technology neutrality. So we're able to really support local decisions um, and work with a fleet or a consumer to decide what makes the most sense for them depending on what their economic situation is or where they are in the country. Uh, the technology portfolio really covers the gamut um, in terms of alternative fuels and advanced technology uh, vehicles and energy efficiency measures. Um, and in order to help certain markets achieve market penetration uh, with these lower carbon domestic energy sources, we really partner with any type of organization to, to bring a particular alt fuel program to fruition. Um, as I mentioned, there's about 90 of us scattered throughout the country. We cover, the boundaries cover over 80% of the population. So no matter where you are in the country, you can most likely find a Clean Cities Coalition to work with. Uh, in terms of top accomplishments, the coalitions have displaced over 2.5 billion gallons of gasoline since 1993. And that's essentially equivalent of removing over 500,000 cars from the road or almost 300 million tons of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. Uh, and coalitions have been directly responsible for the deployment of over 70% of the alternative fuel vehicles that are on the road today and the more than 6,000 alternative refueling stations in the U.S. Um, and there's about just around 700,000 AFVs on the road and coalitions have been responsible for putting most of those on the road, either through funding or technical assistance. Um, and we're, we have a, a great national parks program. A lot, uh, we've been responsible for a lot of the efforts going on in the national parks, as we know. Air quality is very important to them. Um, and inducing behavior change, education and outreach is critically important. So a lot of coalitions spend a lot of time on education and outreach. And in 2008, we reached over 113 million people through over 1,300 different uh, types of outreach activities throughout the country. And so that's kind of a background of the program. Um, and a lot of folks ask me, well, what do you actually do day to day? What does your job entail? So a typical day for a coordinator might uh, consist of hosting a media event or a grand opening after we've worked with a fuel retailer to put in biodiesel or ethanol. Uh, we might facilitate a meeting, for example, with all the stakeholders involved in getting uh, regions ready for electric vehicles. We might write a proposal for a fleet that wants to do a CNG uh, waste hauler project. But most of our time is really um, relationship building and networking, and bringing the right people to the table to have the whole package um, that to overcome the chicken and the egg barrier that everyone talks about with alt fuels. And so our coalition, Virginia Clean Cities, is, uh, happens to be a 501c3 not-for-profit, but not all of the coalitions are nonprofits. They're all housed sometimes in energy offices or councils of governments. Uh, we have six full-time employees scattered throughout three offices in the state. One's at James Madison University, one's in Virginia Beach, and one's in Richmond. Um, and that's six full-time employees that work all day, every day, dedicated to decreasing our dependence on foreign oil and displacing um, petroleum in Virginia. Some examples of what we've been up to um, are we are managing the Southeast Propane Auto Gas Development Program, and this is one of the Recovery Act projects. Some of you might know that there was $300 million through the Recovery Act for Clean Cities pilot programs. And so 25 different uh, projects were funded up to $15 million with 50% matching funds to do basically any type of alt fuel advanced technology vehicle deployment or infrastructure development. And our program uh, it covers nine southeastern states from essentially Maryland and D.C. all the way down to Florida and over to Mississippi. 
and we're going to convert 1,200 vehicles to run on propane, auto gas. We'll put in at least 17 propane refueling stations in the first two years and then move to uh, increase in public availability. And we're expecting to create or retain 600 jobs just through this one program. A couple other programs I'll mention is uh, we're working with the Virginia Port Authority on a green operators program to gr green the drayage trucks. Uh, they're very dirty. They usually get the, the last round of life and uh, the trucks out there. And so we're trying to hit a 20% penetration of replacing them to meet 2007 air quality standards. And we're on target to do that by next year. Uh, we're also facilitating the Virginia Get Ready initiative, which is basically uh, focused on getting Virginia ready for electric vehicles, and um, which some of them are uh, due out this fall, actually, the Volt and um, Think, which Barry talked about earlier, some of those others. So that's a little bit about what we're doing. Um, and just in closing, I wanted to mention that there's, does anyone know how many registered cars there are in the U.S. today? Just light duty cars? No? There's... 250 million, over 250 million registered light duty cars. And so there's, there's only 700,000 alternative fuel vehicles, and that includes light, medium, and heavy duty. So that's a quarter of 1% of um, the population of just the light duty cars. So it's a very small percentage, and we've been working for over 15 years on this. Um, we've made a lot of progress, but there's still a lot more to do. Um, and I would say that, that the best place to start is to, to get in touch with your local Clean Cities Coalition because they're really where the rubber meets the road. Um, and I just want to thank Carol for having us. Uh, I don't see Karen here. Um, our, our, our third panelist. So what I'd like to do is to go ahead and open it up for your questions. So if anyone has questions, we'll take those. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, I have questions for all of you. The first one, um, there are a lot of buildings, buildings from the 70s and we all to 2010. So are we talking about implementation of aesthetics in terms of setting up, for example, either solar, thermal, or whatever it needs to be done to bring uh, energy efficiency in the buildings, what are you going to do with that? They just can't install. You know, like if you talk about the government buildings, government buildings are years and years, hundreds of years old, are very beautiful. So what are you going to do with that? What do you think? The thinking about how to maintain the study and get the energy efficiency. Yeah, I mean that's that's certainly one of the concerns. Um, you know, one of the one of the aspects of uh, high performance is recognizing the historic applicability of uh, buildings and making sure that you know you maintain that as as part of the performance of the building. Um, it's certainly something that you should expect um, out of historic buildings. Um, I think there are uh, you know certainly a lot of things. Um, as I mentioned, you know, efficiency is something that generally doesn't have to impact any of the aesthetics of the building. Um, so, of course, you want to initially at least work as hard as you can uh, to increase the efficiency of the building. Um, and then you can look into things like renewables. Um, you know, if you have a, a flat roof on a historic building, you know, solar can work without, you know, e anybody even knowing it's there. Um, and then that's also when you get into this community approach. Uh, to renewables rather than a site-by-site -site, uh, approach. So if, you know, at the building next door, if they have a, you know, a parking lot structure, um, you know, you can put, uh, you know, a, a solar system on the roof of the parking lot structure without really affecting, um, you know, the aesthetics of the particular building. Um, or you can do wind turbines or, you know, whatever you, you would like to do. But um, you certainly need to consider um, the aesthetics and historic uh, <laughs> My question for Claire is, you said how many millions of cars do you have in the U.S. registered? 250 million. No, no, no. Uh, you asked that question. It should be the other way around. How many good transportation systems do you have to avoid that? I mean, if you look at Europe, the United Kingdom goes from, I, I have been going from Tokyo, all the United Kingdom, from Scotland, all the way down to Ireland. 
one lot of sanitation, you don't need cost. Mm -hmm. So the question should be long term. And the reason why we have 250 million, I couldn't have a plan if I had a good transportation system. That's, that's really important. I completely agree with you. I mean, obviously, it's best to not use a, a gallon of petroleum, so walking and biking and then stepping up to carpooling and using public transit, and we promote all of those means. Um, and I agree, I take the train up here from Virginia Beach, uh, but if I want to go to the western part of the state. So those are some of the, the things that we are working on in our, in our individual states. I, I might also mention that this year, um, uh, well, we'll see whether or not Congress really gets to it, but, but another major authorization bill that is under consideration is the transportation authorization bill. And obviously looking at um, everything that needs to go into that in terms of kind of um, uh, creating both a climate lens for that as well as a much more efficient and how we bring in renewables into that um, is, is a critical piece. And so there's a lot of interest up here with regard to looking at doing much more on transit in, ter in, ter um, in terms of both light rail as well as uh, intercity high-speed rail, um, as well as improved bus systems. Uh, and so I think it's really, really critical that people make sure that policymakers are aware of how important this is to their constituents, their communities the kinds of things that can be done. And as we um, also look at technologies that we, um, and I know that uh, earlier this year we had done a forum really looking at transit systems and the advantages that investment in public transportation had with regard to economic development and jobs. And once again, you have these incredible supply chains across the country um, with regard to thinking about the components that go into buses, into rail cars, et cetera. So it really is, um, your point is very, very important, and I think that a lot of us think that we need to be doing a lot more on that. So um, There are um, a couple programs uh, within Department of Energy um, that actually tie the, the transportation and buildings together fairly well. Um, there are livable communities initiatives mm -hmm. where, um, you know, you pl you plan out, you know, where the transportation nodes will be, where the buildings will be, uh, what types of buildings should be there, and, and those kinds of things. So there really is, uh, you know, starting to be some effort as far as understanding um, kind of the big picture of how transportation and buildings interact. Right, and to make them very friendly for walking, biking, et cetera. Okay, over here. Uh, Some fuels are probably cleaner than others. When I was walking in here today, I saw a clean natural gas powered bus. And to me, that should have said cleaner because I like natural gas, but it's not clean. Um, do, you ever, do you ever run into situations where Before I take a swing and feel like maybe they're not advertising honestly? <laughs> That's another twig question. Um, what we generally do is uh, because it is such an infant industry and we have so much work to do. We will work with individual fleets and we will look at their duty cycles and what they do and we will determine what options they have, whether that's replacing a big SUV with a smaller car or a sedan if they can do that and accomplish the same job or if they have diesel vehicles that can use biodiesel, their legacy vehicles, or if they have flex fuel vehicles that can use E85. So we really look at the comprehensive picture and figure out what works for them. And even if something works, they might not be able to afford it. So they want to do natural gas, but it's a $40,000 premium on a waste hauler, and it's a $500,000 station. And so then we look for funding opportunities to offset that cost or tax incentives or what have you. So it's, it's not just as simple as saying, yeah, that's cleaner, so you have to do that, because each fleet and consumer has different driving cycles and different duty cycles. And so it's really important to look at what they do day to day and figure out the most efficient and cleanest way to do that with what we have available. Back here. Mm -hmm. It's probably a question for Chelsea. Um, I think, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 
I think many of us in this room are probably guilty of uh, being stuck in D.C. while trying to advocate these changes for the entire country. So I'm just wondering uh, what type of public reaction do you usually meet at these events where you're you know, advocating a decreased usage of petroleum um, in American cities, even rural America? Um, in general, the public doesn't really know about a lot of the alternatives, uh, and they're really excited about them. But part of the problem is, one, we don't want to get out of our cars, and we, we don't want to carpool in general, um, and two, we don't have access to the fuel. So what we do is try and make the business case for a retailer to put in an alternative fuel so that it can be accessed by the, by the public, but they have to be able to make money. There has to be a business case. and so. What's really tough right now is we can't find, um, sometimes we can, but we can't find enough fleet vehicles and consumer vehicles in one market for that retailer to make the plunge to invest in a biodiesel or ethanol plant or CNG station. But um, the public is all over it. There's a Honda GX um, that's CNG fueled that I drove for a couple of years, and I got around with two stations in all of Hampton Roads, and that, that was really behavior change. The first month really stunk. <laughs> and I ran out of fuel one time and got towed. Barry knows all about that. Um, but if you give them the option um, and they have the fuel, then, you know, they're going to. Yes. Um, and, and it has been for a long time, and we've been successful with some of the larger fleets that have really lo that have a lot of throughput. Um, but what's been really great about Recovery Act, I mentioned the $300 million, is that gives us enough money to overcome that. So our propane oil gas program, um, we have 16 fleets, and that provides funding for the station, for the vehicle conversion, for everything they need to do so that they're willing to say, okay, I'll convert 300 vehicles in my fleet to use this. And that's, that's substantial. That's a lot of petroleum reduction. And I think your point, once people start doing it, you get one fleet, it's a lot easier to get other people in an area as you start to aggregate those markets. There's a question back here. Zero net energy buildings, particularly if, if we believe the numbers that were an extra four percent or whatever, you can build a zero net energy building, and I presume that for most of the existing stock, you can retrofit to get close to anyway. Although that's a little bit more problematic. Is the problem with green building codes and so on the problem with getting their primary, the main constraint, something about the ignorance of? city councils who approve these things, or is it the construction industry that doesn't want to change, or is it the ignorance of building owners or managers that maybe this wouldn't be such a good idea to developers oppose it? What are the, what is the main constraint or what are the main constraints to it? Or all of the above. <laughs> yeah, it, it's generally all of the above. Um, I think from my perspective, I would say the, uh, the largest issue is actually getting folks to recognize the difference between first costs and life cycle costs. Um, that, um, you know, over the life of a building, uh, it may, you know, cost a little bit more to do, uh, you know, some of these uh, designs or put in some of these technologies or those kinds of things, but um, you're not spending money on energy costs. Um, you're, you're reducing operations and maintenance. Um, one thing that, that's uh, heavily overlooked is actually the productivity of the people in the buildings. Um, there's uh, statistics, something like uh, the value of the work that gets done in the building far outweighs any investment you put in the building uh, itself. So um, if you have happy people, uh, you know, your building is more productive, uh, and so you uh, either save costs or uh, you know, increase the productivity of your people, resulting in more more uh, benefits. So, but one point there, Ryan, that I just wanted to add is that what we've also found that, in addition to improved productivity and and I would also say improve public health, actually, that you we also have the other side, which is when a building is is, for example, is retrofitted and made much more efficient. It's also really important to make sure that people understand how to best use the building and because human behavior, how we behave in a building really does make a difference. 
Um, and so that's another very important component of, of, um, of how we do things. And that's true with a lot of things, but certainly in terms of making buildings work properly. Yeah, we, the, sorry. We actually, uh, we tend to think of, uh, you know, operations and maintenance staff as the people that, you know, can keep the building operating the way it should be. But uh, it's really occupants as well. Um, I've heard uh, crazy stories about, um, you know, at, at night buildings have attempted to set back their thermostats, but uh, some uh, ingenuitive person hooked up a hair dryer next to the thermostat to blow all night. So, um, you know, so it would be cool enough in the morning when people got there. And so um, you, you need to have people that are in the buildings on board as well. Um, okay. We will have to go quickly. Uh, okay. Back here first. Quickly. Quickly. Um, You said that mobile is, is uh, zero, um, is uh, net zero buildings. So why not have positive buildings? Uh, I mean, if you've got a suite of technologies, why not just you know, go all out and, and have actually buildings and get back to the grid? I mean, to some extent, you know, that could get over the problem of the capital. To the, I mean, obviously, you can't do too many renovations in the capital building. Um, you can't put a windmill on it, but the rest of the buildings around it are giving back. So, uh, so, I mean, it just seems like that should be the ultimate. And it, and it really is. But um, I think if we look at kind of, uh, you know, buildings as an aggregate, like you said, you know, some are going to have the opportunity to be uh, producers. Some are going to have to, you know, take electricity off of the grid. So um, ultimately, yeah, net positive. Um, but you also need to have buildings to have that energy go to. So, um, but it could go into transportation, so. <laughs> which many of them will if we do this right. Okay, there were a couple other hands. Okay, here, uh, we'll take two more. Okay, and quickly. Okay. Um, we work uh, significantly with U.S. Green Building Council, um, you know, a lot of the code groups, International Code Council, NFPA, uh, IAPMO. Um, we basically um, are a step back from the LEED program. Uh, it's basically the things that underlie, um, you know, how the LEED program is developed, um, you know, what are the various different technologies and practices uh, that should be, uh, you know, included in green building rating systems or in uh, codes and standards. Um, so it's certainly uh, the activities that we're engaged in feed into uh, programs like LEED and codes and standards, but um, not necessarily kind of directly. Question here. Uh, work with the environmental justice community in, in making sure that um, there are um, equitable uh, divisions of, of where the improvements get made. Also, there are probably areas of, of synergy there for some of the communities that um, maybe the poorest also have the most uh, potential for uh, cleaner energy and, and retrofits and, and even some environmental and toxic sites may you know, benefit from some of these of us. Uh, I know that the, so the U.S. DOE program is headquartered here in D.C., and they do work with EPA and some of the environmental justice programs. Um, and like I said, the program's decentralized, so it really depends on the coalition to, to, um, to say how involved they are. I know we personally have worked with a few of the environmental justice groups, Southern, uh, Law, Southern Law Center and uh, Virginia Blue Moon Fund, um, particularly on public transit. Uh, because a lot of times um, they live in areas with higher pollution and they're subjected to, you know, the older vehicles. That there's a lot of issue. There's been some studies linking cancer to indoor air quality buses and things. Um, so we do interact with some of those groups, especially on grant programs. Um, if a funding opportunity comes available, you know, we'll collaborate on that. But we're, we're, I know we're not there. We need to do more. So we're, we're trying to get there. Great, thank you. And um, at this time, we'll have to conclude this panel so that we can move to our next one, which will be on solar energy. And so we'll ask those folks to come forward and, and please help yourself to handouts up here. And really appreciate your being here for this. And thank you to our speakers. Thank you.